You see, it isn't very often I have the pleasure of taking a visitor into my little nest. The old girl is slightly dodgy, Billy told himself. But at five and six pence a night, who gives a damn about that? I should have thought you'd be simply swamped with applicants, he said politely. Oh, I am, my dear. I am. Of course I am. But the trouble is that I'm inclined to be just a teeny weeny bit choosy and particular, if you see what I mean. Ah, oh, yes. But I'm always ready. Everything is always ready, day and night in this house, just on the off chance that an acceptable young gentleman will come along. And it is such a pleasure, my dear, such a very great pleasure when now and again I open the door and I see someone standing there who is just exactly right. She was halfway up the stairs and she paused with one hand on the stair rail, turning her head and smiling down at him with pale lips. Like you, she added and her blue eyes traveled slowly all the way down the length of Billy's body to his feet and then up again. On the first floor landing, she said to him, this floor is mine. They climbed up a second flight. And this one is all yours, she said. Here's your room. I do hope you'll like it. She, told, she took him into a small but charming front bedroom, switching on the light as she went in. The morning sun comes right in the window, Mr. Perkins. It is Mr. Perkins, isn't it? No, he said. It's Weaver. Mr. Weaver, how nice. I've put a water bottle between the sheets to air them out, Mr. Weaver. It's such a comfort to have a hot water bottle in a strange bed with clean sheets. Don't you agree? And you may light the gas fire at any time if you feel chilly. Thank you, Billy said. Thank you ever so much. He noticed that the bedspread had been taken off the bed and that the bedclothes had been neatly turned back on one side, all ready for someone to get in. I'm so glad you appeared, she said, looking earnestly into his face. I was beginning to get worried. That's all right, Billy answered brightly. You mustn't worry about me. He put his suitcase on the chair and started to open it. And what about supper, my dear? Did you manage to get anything to eat before you came here? I'm not a bit hungry, thank you, he said. I think I'll just go to bed as soon as possible because tomorrow I've got to get up rather early and report to the office. Very well then, I'll leave you now so that you can unpack. But before you go to bed, would you be kind enough to pop into the sitting room on the ground floor and sign the book? Everyone has to do that because it's the law of the land. And we don't want to go breaking any laws at this stage in the proceedings, do we? She gave him a little wave of the hand and went quickly out of the room and closed the door. Now, the fact that his landlady appeared to be slightly off her rocker didn't worry Billy in the least. After all, she, ha she was not only harmless, but there was no question about that, but she was also quite obviously a kind and generous soul. He guessed that she had probably lost a son in the war or something like that and had never gotten over it. So a few minutes later, after unpacking his suitcase and washing his hands, he trotted downstairs to the ground floor and entered the living room. His landlady wasn't there, but the fire was glowing in the hearth and the little Dachon was sleeping in front of it. The room was wonderfully warm and cozy. I'm a lucky fellow, he thought, rubbing his hands. This is a bit of all right. He found the guest book lying open on the piano, so he took out his pen and wrote down his name and address. There were only two other entries above his on the page, and as one always does with guest books, he started to read them. One was a Christopher Mulholland from Cardiff. The other was Gregory W. Temple from Bristol. That's funny, he thought suddenly. Christopher Mulholland, it rings a bell. 
Now where on earth had he heard that rather unusual name before? Was he a boy at school? No. Was it one of his sister's numerous young men, perhaps, or a friend of his father's? No, no, it wasn't any of those. He glanced down again at the book. Christopher Mulholland, 231 Cathedral Road, Cardiff. Gregory W. Temple, 27 Sycamore Drive, Bristol. As a matter of fact, now he came to think of it, he wasn't at all sure that the second name didn't have almost as much of a familiar ring about it as the first. Gregory Temple, he said aloud, searching his memory. Christopher Mulholland, such charming boys, a voice behind him answered. And he turned and he saw his landlady sailing into the room with a large silver tea tray in her hands. She was holding it well out in front of her, a rather high up, as though the tray were a pair of reins on a frisky horse. They sound somehow familiar, he said. They do, how interesting. I'm almost positive I've heard those names before somewhere. Isn't that queer? Maybe it was in the newspapers. They weren't fam famous in any way, were they? I mean, famous cricketers or footballers or something like that. Famous, she said, setting the tea tray down on the low table in front of the sofa. Oh, no, I don't think they were famous, but they were extraordinarily handsome, both of them. I can promise you that. They were tall and young and handsome, my dear, just exactly like you. Once more, Billy glanced down at the book. Look here, he said, noticing the dates. This last entry is over two years old. It is. Yes, indeed. And Christopher Mulholland's is nearly a year before that. More than three years ago. Dear me, she said, shaking her head and heaving a dainty little sigh. I would never have thought it. How time does fly from us all, doesn't it, Mr. Wilkins? It's Weaver, Billy said. W-E-A-V-E-R. Oh, of course it is, she cried, sitting down on the sofa. How silly of me. I do apologize. In one ear and out the other. That's me, Mr. Weaver. You know something, Billy said. Something that's really quite extraordinary about all this. No, dear, I don't. Well, you see, both of these names, Maholland and Temple, I not only seem to remember each one of them separately, so to speak, but somehow or other, in some particular way, they both appear to be sort of connected together as well, as though they were both famous for the same sort of thing. If you see what I mean, like like Dempsey and Tunney, for example, or Churchill and Roosevelt. How amusing, she said. But come over here now, dear, and sit beside me on the sofa, and I'll give you a nice cup of tea and a ginger biscuit before you go to bed. You really shouldn't bother, Billy said. I didn't mean you to do anything like that. He stood by the piano, watching her as she fussed about with her cups and saucers. He noticed that she had a small white, she had small white quickly moving hands and red fingernails. I'm almost positive it was in the newspapers I saw them, Billy said. I'll think of it in a second. I'm sure I will. There is nothing more tantalizing than a thing like this which lingers just outside the borders of one's memory. He hated to give up. Now wait a minute, he said. Wait just a minute. Maholland, Christopher Maholland, wasn't that the name of the Eaton schoolboy who was on a walking tour through the West Country? And then all of a sudden, milk, she said, and sugar? Yes, please. 
And then all of a sudden, 